President. Senator from Tennessee. Mr. President, I ask consent that uh, Senator Bennett and I. Want a quorum call, sir? Oh. Mr. President, I ask consent to vitiate the quorum call. Without objection? I ask consent that Senator Bennett and I have up to 10 minutes for a colloquy. Without objection? Uh, How would the time be allotted, sir? <laughs> up to 10 minutes. Up to 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, Mr. 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 President, uh, Senator Bennett and I have just announced a, an effort that I think most teachers, most principals, many parents will, will uh, want to be a part of. We're going to look at the education system in Tennessee and Colorado, two of the more progressive states in education, to see if there are too many tests and too many regulations. We want to make sure that the tests we have are good tests, the regulations we have are reasonable tests, and any minute that we can save from an unneeded test or an unnecessary regulation is a minute a teacher can spend devoted to teaching. So we've done two things. One, uh, we are introducing today legislation that will, we hope will be a part of the new Elementary and Secondary Education Act when it's passed that will have the Education Secretary set up a task force that would do something we don't usually do in government, which is subtract instead of add government. In other words, to continuously ask teachers, principals, and others what tests, what regulations are unnecessary so that we can get rid of them. Uh, second, we're going to start right away to do this in Colorado and Tennessee. We've talked to our governors, Governor Hickenlooper and Governor Haslam, and, and we're going to put together a task force of, of educators uh, in our state and ask them to say to us what regulations are unnecessary, what tests are unnecessary. When I was governor, I used to say to the education secretary, who was then Bill Bennett, there are too many federal regulations. He would say to me, I'll bet you've got more state regulations than federal regulations, and he was right. And when I was education secretary, I had many uh, teachers and others say to me, we can't do this, we can't do that because of a federal regulation, when in fact, there was no such federal regulation. What often happens is that the confusion between what the federal government requires and what the state government requires creates uh, inordinate confusion in the classroom and teachers feel all tied up. So we're going to start right away to, 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 to do this. Um, we're both very excited about this. We, we, we think this, is, this w should, should give teachers and others in the classroom uh, an opportunity to, to do their jobs. You know, they one day less on an unneeded test might mean one more day teaching a child United States history, which would suit me, suit me fine. I want to congratulate Senator Bennett for his contribution to the debate, his ideas. Uh, it, it, his ideas come from the experience of a, an extraordinarily successful superintendent of the Denver public school system. We're taking his more recent experience and teachers and principals, and we'll look forward to reporting to our colleagues what we find, as well as uh, to Secretary Duncan, who will be a full partner in this with us, and we hope this is part of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act when it is enacted in a bipartisan way by this Congress. Senator. Mr. President. Senator from Colorado. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to thank uh, Senator Alexander for his leadership over so many years on education issues confronting this country and making sure that every child in America has the opportunity to fulfill their, uh, their full potential and for his work on this bipartisan effort to do something very, very unusual for government and also for public education, which is actually to begin an inquiry about not what the next rule should be, not what the next regulation should be, but whether there are rules and regulations that are now obsolete, or whether our state regulations and our federal regulations are actually not accounting for each other in any way other than to overburden the people that are actually teaching our kids and, and, our, and our kids themselves. You know, I used to spend a lot of time when I was the superintendent of the Denver Public Schools wondering why everyone in Washington was so mean to our teachers and so mean to our kids. And now that I've been here a couple of years, I know that people here aren't mean. 
But this Senate floor is a very long way from the classrooms in this country, very long way from the classrooms in Tennessee, a long way from the classrooms in Colorado. And we have to remember uh, what the effects are of everything we do on, on that moment when a teacher is in her classroom with 20 or 30 kids and is trying to do her best to make sure they move forward. So this is an opportunity to not to show up with the answers, uh, but to ask questions of our teachers and our, and our principals and our moms and our dads and see what kinds of things we can take away. I've learned something since I've been here, uh, which is that an awful lot of the burden that we're placing on, on people in our, in our schools and our classrooms is the way in which state and federal regulations interact with each other. And if we can uh, reduce that burden while at the same time elevating our accountability system, improve our accountability system, make sure we're holding everybody accountable uh, for delivering for outcomes for our kids, that not only will we get better results, but we're going to find out that there's a lot more time in the school day, in the school year, for kids to have a well-rounded education all across America. So I want to thank our former education secretary for his work. I want to thank our current education Secretary Arne Duncan for working with us uh, on this initiative and I'm, I'm just so looking forward to having a conversation with people where we're saying what can we take away rather than what are we going to impose on you next. Mr. President, Senator from Tennessee. Mr. President, I'd like to ask consent to include in the record uh, a memorandum on the Colorado-Tennessee Working Group on Effective Regulation and Assessment Systems for Public Education, which outlines the roles that Senator Bennett and I and Secretary Duncan, along with Governor Haslam of Tennessee and Governor Hickenlooper of Colorado, uh, will, will, will have. Without objection, sir. And if I may just say one more time what I think the, the bottom line of this proposal by Senator Bennett and me uh, is, every minute that a teacher spends on an unneeded test or regulation is a minute that the teacher cannot devote to teaching a child. So what we are asking the teachers of Tennessee and Colorado to do for us is to identify the rules and regulations that we need and the rules and regulations that we can get rid of. Senator from I just want to add one more example just from Colorado. The, thank you, Mr. President, just from the experience uh, in Denver. You know, we, 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 we complied with No Child Left Behind in, in the Denver Public Schools, but there was something that really didn't make sense to me and didn't make sense to our teachers and didn't make sense to our families, which is we thought we were asking and answering a completely irrelevant question when it came to accountability, which was how did this year's fourth graders do compared to last year's fourth graders? You know, the accountability system all across the United States is based on that. And what our teacher said to me was, Michael, it's irrelevant because they're not the same kids, and they're right. And so we moved to a system that asked the question, how did this group of fifth graders do compared to how they did as fourth graders, compared to how they did as third graders, and compared to how every other child in the state of Colorado with a statistically similar test history did as well. All of a sudden, we began to see places that were actually driving growth for kids, but that were completely unrecognized by the federal law. And we saw other places where kids were achieving at high levels, but were falling behind during the course of the year. There is a lot of wisdom out there in, in this country about how to move our kids forward. And what we've got to do, I think, is tear down some of the barriers in the way of, of those good ideas. It took me a long, long time to get that performance system signed off on, uh, at both the state and the federal level. Now the state of Colorado has a growth model, and we're talking about growth models all over the country uh, as a result of the work we did in Colorado and good work that's been done in other states as well. Sometimes people ask, why is it so hard to scale quality in public education? And if we can, in some small way, uh, tear down some of the unintended barriers uh, to, to that scaling of quality education, uh, I think, I think uh, our kids will be the better for it. So again, I want to thank the Senator from Tennessee for signing up on this initiative. I look forward to learning with him uh, what's working well and what's not working so well uh, in our two respective states and then watching this spread across the United States. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank the Senator from Tennessee. 
Thank you, Mr. President, and I yield the floor. I notice the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Senator from Alabama. I would ask that the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Mr. President, we'll be soon voting on a continuing resolution and to carry continue funding of the United States government uh, for three weeks. I believe that will reduce spending over that three-week period by two uh, billion dollars a week, uh, which is um, far less than the debt we are encouraging incurring each one of those weeks. But it is a significant progress added to the four billion we did in a previous two-week CR. I'll support this. I think it keeps us on track to achieve a $61 billion reduction in federal spending of this fiscal year, which ends September 30th. This is important that we take action. Uh, it's a matter that is important financially to American business interests, uh, foreign business interests who may be in thinking of investing in the United States, and people who might buy our huge number of treasury bills uh, that we sell each week and uh, are purchased by people all over the world. They want to know, that we, do we have our house in order or not? Is this a safe place to invest their money or not? And we need to begin to do something now. And when our majority leader, uh, Senator Reid, propose that not $61 billion, but, but, but that we reduce spending only $4 billion uh, throughout the rest of this fiscal year. Uh, I said then and believe now that is only a product of a bubble being in the Washington bubble. It's, it's a, we're bubbleized people. We're, we're in denial about the reality of the crisis that we face and I do not want to talk down the American economy. Uh, I believe the American worker is competitive and is willing to work and be competitive, can be competitive, but we cannot burden that worker down with excessive debt. Well, how does that happen? I'm ranking Republican on the Budget Committee, and we've heard testimony from... Uh, Doctors Rogoff and Reinhardt written a book called This Time It's Different. Um, their study of nations who've gotten in trouble financially and who've had debt crises over the last 20 years shows a consistent pattern, consistent pattern of problems. One of the things they concluded is that when a nation's debt reaches 90% of the total economy, 90% of GDP, the economic growth in that country slows down. And uh, the um, uh, median uh, was 1%, but the average was more than 1%. And some countries had more than 1% drop in growth. Japan has a higher debt than we, I think the highest in the world. Uh, they have an interesting way that they've been able to finance it, but they've had no growth for quite a long time. It's consistent with the rogoff reinhardt study. Does that apply to us? Well, we are about 95% now. Uh, our debt is surging. Uh, by the end of this fiscal year, September 30th, uh, the numbers are that our debt will be 100% of GDP, well above the figure. And when you say, well, what does 1% growth mean? Well, if you're looking for a growth of 2 or 3%, 1% is half your growth, maybe. Uh, and uh, what does it mean in other terms? Experts have, have said that a 1% reduction in your uh, gro growth amounts to a million jobs lost. A million jobs lost. So I believe we're beginning to feel a negative pull on our bounce back from this recession as a result of growing debt right now. Not years down the road, as some people have been saying and predicting, we're going to have a debt crisis down the road. I hate to say it, all I can tell you is what I've been told at our committee. Erskine Bowles, he was President Ob uh, Clinton's chief of staff. He was appointed by President Obama to co-chair the Debt Commission with Senator Alan Simpson. 
They testified before our committee last week. And this is what they said about the nature of the crisis we face. They spent weeks studying the numbers, hearing from experts all over the world, economists and others about our debt situation, and they have reported that we've got to take action now. In a joint statement they presented to the committee, they said that this is the most predictable financial crisis this nation has ever faced. In other words, we're on a course. They said if we don't change course, it'll be the most predictable uh, crisis we faced. And so Senator Conrad, our Democratic chairman, who's uh, very concerned about these issues, asked him about when. And Mr. Bowles, who himself a financial successful businessman and a financier, uh, Mr. Bowles said two years. Maybe a little less, maybe a little more. And Senator Simpson uh, contributed uh, to the discussion and said, I think a year. Well, I hope we don't have some sort of debt crisis uh, in a year. Uh, but the fact that that has even been discussed should be a cause of alarm for us. And let me say, uh, Alan Greenspan said we could have a debt crisis in two to three years in January. And Moody's has discussed downgrading our debt, warned that they might downgrade our debt in less than two years. So that we need to take action now. That's the deal. That's the uh, matter. And we had a big election last fall. And we had some fine new members elected to the House and the Senate. And the American people felt when they elected these people, I am absolutely confident that they would come to Washington and help us get off the wild spending debt course we're on. I believe the American people get it. They're not in a bubble. They know you can't continue this way. And so uh, they're prepared to take some action, and we need to do it. And if we fail to take something that's noticeable and significant, then I think it would send the wrong message around the world. It would say even with this election change that occurred in Washington, you're still not changing your course. Well, <clears throat> you may have heard that the president um, said in the State of the Union, and I urged him before that uh, to... Uh, talk straight to the American people about the threat that we face, uh, he did not do so. In the first 37 minutes of his speech was new investments he called on us to make. Investments, of course, is new spending. He never once took a few moments to explain to us the kind of things that um, Mr. Erskine Bowles said, or Mr. Alan Greenspan said, how we were on an unsustainable course. He never acknowledged we were on an unsustainable course. He never warned us that we're going to have to tighten our belts like governors are doing, like mayors are doing all over America, like Governor Manchin had to do in West Virginia. I mean, this is, when you don't have money, you don't have money. You don't have money, you have to change course. But I was really disappointed, um, and I think some of my Democrat colleagues have raised, Senator Manchin has raised uh, disappointment that we haven't had that kind of national dialogue uh, as to why we have to ask the American people to receive uh, uh, somewhat less from the federal government than they've been receiving. Why do we have to do it? Because we're facing a crisis, and good leadership, to me, uh, means that the leader has to tell the people what the threat is, what the danger is, and how we're going to get out of it. And I truly believe that one of the highest duties of any member of Congress or any leader in America is to protect the American people from foreseeable dangers. And as Erskine Bowles said, this is the most predictable crisis we've ever faced. It's heading to a bad end. Hopefully not as soon as they warned us it could happen. So we'll have time to get off this course. But uh, that's important. 
So the president says in his State of the Union that we'll be living within our means. He did a radio address after he submitted his budget, and he said that uh, we're going to be living within our means. My budget puts us on a track to prosperity. Uh, we are going to continue to invest, and we'll be living within our means and paying down the debt. And Mr. Jack Lew, the key chairman, uh, director of the Office of Management and Budget, where all the money has to be managed inside any president's administration, uh, Mr. Lew says it'll, we're going to be living within our means and paying down our debt. Basically, they're saying, don't worry. You guys are getting all helped up. This is political talk. Uh, we can still invest. We can still spend. Don't worry about it. But what do the facts say? We don't need political talk. We need a fact-based budget. We need fact-based discussions. And the facts are we're not going to be paying down our debt in 10 years under the president's budget. We're not going to be living within our means. What is the situation? His own budget is four volumes. These are the figures in his budget, his projections, his plan, really, because that's what a budget is. It's your plan for the next decade. In that plan, uh, it calls for spending levels that increase the total gross debt of the United States from $13 trillion to $26 trillion. Under that budget plan, the lowest single annual deficit that occurs is over $600 billion. The highest deficit President Bush ever had was 450. That was too high. The lowest he's projecting in his own numbers is 600. And more troubling, years 7, 8, 9, 10 of his budget, the deficits are going up. It's almost about $900 billion in the 10th year. So the deficits course is not a good course. How could they say that? How could the president look the American people in the eye and says, my budget is going to call us to live within our means? And Mr. Liu say that. Well, I examined him in the budget committee. I said, Mr. Liu, the lowest deficit you're going to have is $600 billion. How is that living within our means? He said, well, there's uh, something called the primary deficit. I said, what? The primary deficit. Well, what is that? Well, you don't count interest. You don't count interest. Well, when you're a family who's living in tight times today, trying to squeeze their budget, do they not count their interest on their uh, credit card or their mortgage payment? How can you say you're balancing the budget, you're living within your means, and not count interest that you pay on the debt? All the money we borrow, we have to pay interest on. The 13 trillion, 14 trillion, I guess it is now, uh, we pay interest on that, and if it doubles to 26, we'll pay interest on that. Last year, our interest payment for the United States of America was about 208 or so billion dollars. 200 billion in interest payments. What about the 10th year under the president's budget? 844 billion according to his numbers. This is the fastest growing item in the entire budget. And Mr. President, they assume uh, interest rate at 3.5%. Uh, that's, I don't think we're going, most experts would not uh, believe that's going to remain so low. This is historically very low. Historically, we average about 6% on our debt. So if it went from 3% to 6.7%, to uh, instead of $840 billion, I guess it would be $1,900,000,000 in interest payment. And that could happen. That could happen if we don't get off the unsustainable path we're on. So I, I, I'm really 
frustrated about this. People say, well, this CR before us is only discretionary spending. It's only a small part of the overall budget. You shouldn't even attempt to fool with it. You're just wasting your time. No, no, no. We're going to have to take every part of the budget, step by step, and see what we can do to contain the growth of spending or even reduce spending to eliminate some spending that's totally worthless or virtually so, and we get no real benefit from, that needs to be eliminated. We need to make our government more productive, lean, uh, and efficient. We can do that. Uh, but I guess I go back to the point um, that uh, we're on a wrong course. We cannot continue on the course. Uh, the House of Representatives have passed a, a proposal, a continuing resolution that would reduce spending through the rest of the fiscal year a total of $61 billion. Uh, we should meet that. We should accept that. That's not too much. It's probably not enough, but it is enough to count. For example, it's a $61 billion reduction in baseline U.S. spending. The total spending, when you reduce the baseline, even if next year you start going up uh, 1%, that 1% will be on a baseline that's $61 billion lower. And over a period of time, we've calculated the numbers, over 10 years, that's $61 billion, plus the interest you don't have to pay, will save the United States Treasury $860 billion, close to a trillion. That's a real good step. That does make a difference, and people who deny it makes a difference are wrong. And it's not going to savage anybody unless some of these programs just aren't working and they ought to be zeroed out. So I, I, I want to um, make that point clear. Well, what about how much is the entitlement? I mean, the discretionary spending, the money we spend here on education, on highways, on uh, stuff of that nature, defense. Uh, that's, that's about uh, 20 percent. Uh, that's that's uh, total. Well, discretionary non-defense is about 12 percent of the budget. 60 percent or so is in Social Security and Medicare. And they're growing at an unsustainable rate. It, it's just not healthy. And we need to take steps now to save Social Security, put Social Security on a path that our seniors can rely on it and our young people can have confidence that when they become senior citizens that they can rely on it also. It is not that difficult to do. And this has been talked about by editorial boards and around the country and experts and economists and professors and congressmen and senators for years, but the crisis is getting more real and acute now. But what did the president do? Not one word about that in his State of the Union or his budget. His budget doesn't do anything about any of the entitlements. So you can't cut discretionary spending and you can't cut uh, entitlement spending. In effect, they're saying nothing is uh, to be uh, challenged. And I, I don't think uh, that's a rational approach to the crisis that we're in today. I know it's not a rational approach to it. We've got to work together. We've got senators together right now, Democrat and Republican, that are trying to figure out a way to uh, uh, make some alterations in the trajectory of our debt in America that put us on a sound path. Democrats and Republicans are meeting. Uh, Senator Warner, Senator Chambliss, I think Senator uh, Manchin and others are talking. They'd like to see us do something historic. I really think we do. But on the Budget Committee, Secretary uh, uh, Administrator Jack Lew said that the President w w wasn't for any change. He agreed, he, he took the view that Social Security doesn't have a problem. Nothing's going to happen until 2037. Well, what happens then? It, it falls off a cliff. 
And that's assume you count this paper uh, that's supposed to be backing it up, but the money has been spent. Uh, and Social Security is holding debt paper. We need to get it on a sound course, and we can do it. We've got to work on Medicare, which is even more problematic and more dangerous, and get them on a sound course. And we need to uh, get our head together on discretionary spending and contain our growth in discretionary spending, all of which is possible to do. All of which is possible to do. We've got the opportunity to put our country on a road to prosperity and growth. We'll need to do some things such as uh, reforming our tax laws to, to uh, more fairly raise revenue and in a way that allows more growth to occur because we need to have growth. We've got to create jobs. Uh, <clears throat> We need to redo our energy policy and produce more American energy and hold the cost of energy down, not drive up the cost of gasoline and electricity on the American people. The leadership in this country ought to be working to reduce energy costs, not drive up energy costs. Momentum, I think, is on the side of this. A lot of Republican Democrat talk is going on when Pres uh, Majority Leader Reid offered his uh, a pittance of a reduction, $4 billion reduction. Uh, Ten uh, Democratic senators defected. They didn't vote for it because they didn't think it reduced spending enough. We had three re Republicans not support the $61 billion. They thought it ought to go lower than that. So the momentum out there uh, is to go further than we're going. The American people get it. Uh, our expert testimony and witnesses uh, tell us that. We've seen Bill Gross of the PIMCO bond fund, the largest fund in the world, say they're not buying any more U.S. Treasuries, basically a call on the United States to reduce our debt. He didn't have confidence in it, and not willing to buy it anymore at the rates we're offering. So we need to get busy. And, and do some things, uh, and it's going to have to be done in a bipartisan way. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, so there are two choices, Mr. President, I believe, truly. One is a tougher road, but it's the road to prosperity. It can return us to the kind of leadership role in the world we need to be on, and the other road is the road to decline. You know, nothing comes from nothing. Nothing ever could, Julie Andrews sang. There's no free lunch. Debts have to be paid. Interest has to be paid on debts. This is reality. We don't live in a fantasy world. So the time uh, to stand and be counted is now. This $61 billion reduction in spending through the last seven, six and a half or so months of this fiscal year is a statement. It's actual, it's real, it will reduce the total uh, indebtedness of the United States by $860 billion over 10 years. We could do more. But Congress being what it is, is slowly coming around to the challenge. Uh, we're not ready probably to do more. We need to do $61 billion. We do not need a compromise halfway some $30 billion reduction in spending. I do believe that would show weakness on our part, a lack of resolve, which would not be a good signal for our fragile economy today. Uh, so we need to meet the test uh, to face the defining challenge of our time. And that's spending. It's the dominant issue facing America today, no doubt about it. It dwarfs every other issue. I wish it weren't so. I wish we were here at a time of when I came, uh, 97. Well, I guess we were still fighting over spending then, trying to contain spending. And by 98 or 99, we were in surplus. We balanced the budget. They started in 94. They made some tough decisions. Uh, it's going to be harder this time. 
The, the, the hole is deeper. The demographics and the systemic threats to our financial order is, is greater than it was. There's just no doubt about it, but uh, we can do it. And I think it's our time to fulfill our duty, our nation, duty to our nation and to the American people to preserve the American heritage. Uh, we are uh, standing at a time in this country where we have to make a choice. Let's make this choice. Let's do this more three-week extension, take it down $6 billion more over that three weeks, and then let's come back and just do 61 and celebrate the first real step in decade uh, to uh, contain growth in spending and promise that this is the beginning, that we're going to review all of our, uh, spending, our financial situation in, in this country, and we're going to do it in an honest, above-board way, fact-based, not politics, not smoke and mirrors or fantasy budgets, but real numbers facing real uh, threats. And if we do that, I think the American people will be supportive. They were supportive in the last election. I believe they'll be supportive again. Mr. President, I, I thank the uh, chair for the opportunity to speak. I thank you for your leadership on these issues in the Senate. And I believe there's a growing consensus here that progress must be made. I would yield the floor. Jeff. Mr. President, I note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Christ present, are we? Amen.